pray for the word today. Father, we thank you for the word that you have for your people today. And I thank you that they have the faith already on the inside of them to believe what you are about to say to them. And we pray that faith would come by the hearing of your word in Jesus' name. We pray against every spirit that's not like you in this place, every spirit of witchcraft, every darkness that would try to come in this place and try to dull out this message or dull out your light. We cancel it now in Jesus' name. I thank you for every angel that's in this church right now. Every angel that's in the building right now, I thank you that they are on post and they are guarding your people. Do you keep us safe while we gather together in worship? And you keep us safe from not only physical threats, God, but supernatural ones as well. So, Father, as we are in the comfort of your presence, I pray that your word would fulfill exactly what you've assigned it to do on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We are still talking about Operation Reconciliation, the ministry that we've all been given from God. We all have a part to play. God did not just save us to uh, allow us to go to heaven one day when we die, because usually there's a gap in between those two. If Brother Bob, I'm going to do something out of the ordinary. If you could please come and turn the air up a little bit higher. I want my toes to uh, tremble. They're so cold. All right. Um, we have an assignment to fulfill on this earth, a mandate, uh, and that's the oper that's the Operation Reconciliation. He's given us all the ministry to go out and reconcile people who are lost, people who are in darkness. We have a job to do and an assignment to do, and God is going to empower us to do that. Uh, today is uh, a, a day that's been set aside to honor fathers, so I do say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the building. Can we give them a hand this morning? Thank you so much for being here. And uh, the, the title of the message today is The Family Business and Assignments. So assignments are the family business. We, are, we have been given a business uh, to run with. Uh, just as I am in the family business, my father was the pastor of this church for many years, and now I am the pastor, so I'm in the family business of continuing to preach the gospel. So we are also in the family business. So your natural father might not been, have been a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but your heavenly father definitely has given you an assignment, and that is to, to declare the goodness of God to all the world. As we were worshiping, God gave me an example, an analogy of something that was so powerful. I saw this church as an ark. And you know, back in the day, during the time of Noah, everybody that got on the ark was saved. And every, everyone that was outside of the ark was forever and eternally lost. So as long as you were inside of the ark, you were going to be okay, you were safe, you'd have life. But if you were caught on the outside of the ark when the door shut, they were banging on the door saying, let me in. Because during the time that the ark was being built and it was open for anyone to come in, they did not believe. So when the door shut, they were lost. So here's, what, here's the image God gave me of this church being an ark. That everyone here today, I trust that you're saved. I trust that you know God. But he said that this church represents an ark. And if we are here, and if we are near him, and if we are close to him, that if time would end right now, and all of Lima, if all of Lima would fall off, and the only place in Lima left standing would be this church, we would be okay. Why? Because the church is still standing. We're in the ark. But listen to this assignment. If God told us in advance and said this, listen, everyone that's here today, this is the ark. And if, as long as you're here, when the door closes, you're going to be safe. If God gave us this assignment and says, look, every one of you, you've got one week to get out, of the, get out of this church and go convince as many people as you can to come to New Life, to come into this building so that they won't be lost. You've got one week. That's how the, the way that you'd work during that week is how we should be all the time. You will be trying to convince people, hey, hey, God told me in advance, and I believe it, that next Sunday is it, that anyone that's not in the building, and you're thinking, well, how can everyone in Lima fit in the building? 
Well, guess what? Everyone's not going to believe you. Everyone's not going to believe you, okay? How hard would you work to convince people to say, listen, you please listen to me. If we've got one week. God told me, and I believe this, we've only got one week left, and whoever doesn't come to the church and is not there when Lima is destroyed is going to be lost. But here's the truth of the matter. You don't have one week to get this message out. You've only got one day. You know why? Because tomorrow's not even promised. So the ministry on the inside of each and every one of us should be that serious to where we're telling people about God with such passion that they think we're crazy. They thought Noah was crazy. We need to have such a passion to convince people that time, because people die every day. And Jesus is going to come back at some time, and we have a ministry of uh, telling people about Jesus Christ. That's our assignment. Our assignment is to make God look good, to glorify him, and to light the way for all to see. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. We've got work to do. I'm trying to convince you that coming to church is not the only thing you're supposed to be doing. Reading your Bible and praying, not the only good things, but not the only thing you're supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be carrying forward a ministry. We're supposed to be vocal. We're supposed to be telling people about the goodness of God and the way out of here. This world is going to burn with fire. This world is going to be destroyed. But we know the way out of here. And it's up to us to convince other people, and not all of them will believe you, but don't let that stop you, that Jesus Christ is coming back and that he is the only way that leads to life. We're in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. The, today's topic is the family business, all right? And we have assignments to complete. Verse 14, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their ability. Say this with me. I have abilities. So look. God gave me the ability, obviously, I never wanted to be a pastor, okay? But he gave me the ability to be a pastor. Now, I could be out there, not at church. I could have spent all night at the bar. I could have no uh, relationship with God at all. But I decided that it would be in my best interest eternally to agree with what God made me to be and to serve him and to love him for how good he has been to me. Now, not every single one of you has the ability to be a pastor, but you still have the ability to be a messenger. You still have the ability to tell people about the goodness of God. Why? Because you were born with a mouth and you have the ability to speak. And even those who can't speak audibly, there's this thing called sign language. So none of us are left out when it comes to communicating the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, dividing it into their proportion, to their abilities, he then left on his trip. Sounds a lot like Jesus leaving, okay? Verse 16, the servant who received the five bags of, and let me, let me say this, every single one of you have been given an ability okay, to have this assignment that you were sent for. God sent you to this earth for a reason, not just to experience QP, not to experience Fat Jacks and Cedar Point and do all these things we love to do. We've got an assignment on our lives that one day we'll have to stand in front of God for and hear, hopefully, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Say this with me. I have an assignment. You've got breath in your lungs, you've got strength in your body, and all of it is supposed to be used to complete your assignment. Verse 16, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money. Say this, he worked. 
and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. The most valuable thing in this whole entire world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the ministry that every single one of us has been given. But if you take it and you bury it and you never tell anybody about it, we have dishonored the family business. We have dishonored what God has sent us here to do. Let's continue. Verse 19. After a long time, can you say long time? Long time. My grandmother was 97 years old when she passed, and she served God for a long time. And she's been gone for over a year, and Jesus still hasn't come back yet. Long time. God is so patient with us. He's so very patient with us because he doesn't want to see any of us be lost. So he's opened up this, this era of grace so that we might receive his grace and that he's so patient with us. So he gives us time to complete our assignment. So every day that you wake up is more time to complete your assignment from God. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account. Do you know that this is really going to happen? That at the end of time that God is going to call us forward to him and we're going to have to give an account of what we did in these bodies and what we did on earth? You have work to do. And let me tell you something about this work. It's easy. It's not as hard as the devil makes it seem. It's easy because Jesus Christ gives you his spirit. See, this isn't, you see Damien up here preaching, but this really isn't me. And my father will be the first to tell you because when he came to my house four years ago and knocked on the door and said, God told him that it was time for me to be the pastor. And I said, he did. He said, yeah, he did. And I don't think you're ready. Thanks for believing in me, dad. I don't think you're ready. But after two weeks of being placed in, and after two Sundays, my father came to me and said, he was right. Because that's not you up there. That's not you up there. I know you. And that's not you. That's the glory I'm talking about. That's your assignment. It's not about what you can do for God. It's about what God wants to do through you if you will just surrender your life to him and let his light shine through you. No other place in the universe are you able to just surrender yet still receive glory. No other place are you able to just surrender and still have victory except in God. All right, so after a long time, their master returned from the trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you have gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Say this with me. I am a servant of the Lord. Please don't do better at your natural job than your spiritual one. Please don't serve, be more faithful to your natural job, to the one that comes from heaven. Because at the end of time, it won't be the boss that you have now saying, come on into heaven. It won't be him there. It'll be the one that created you. Amen. Let's continue. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, just lost my place. But anyway, he came and said that he had buried what, what, what had been given to him. And so we know that his master was very displeased 
with him having buried it. So what was given to him was taken away. Here we are. We are back to verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I know you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. Say this with me. I was afraid. And do you know what? That's the same thing that keeps every single one of us from fulfilling the ministry God has given us. We're too afraid to talk to people. We're too afraid to be witnesses. And this one was given the ability. He wasn't given a lot. God didn't give him a lot to do because he knew he was fearful. But that which he gave him, he was still accountable to do that. So some of you would just, if I gave you this mic and said, preach, your knees would be knocking and, and not much would happen. You'd, be, you'd probably faint, okay? So God didn't give you that amount to do, but he still gave you a little bit. Do you hear what I'm saying? God gave you a little bit. So maybe it's 10, 15, 20 people, 50 people you're supposed to tell the gospel to. But however small it is, you just make sure that you're obedient to do exactly what the Father has asked you to do. All right? He was afraid. Here we go. Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. So he's asking us to be his witnesses. So what are you going to tell him? I was afraid that they would make fun of me. I was afraid that they would reject me. I was afraid that, they, that, that it just wouldn't work, that they wouldn't receive you. So listen to me. Let me tell you something. Not everybody's going to receive the message of Jesus Christ that you tell them, but don't take it personal. Do you know why? If I took things personal, I'd stop preaching. Do you know why? Because I'm talking to a room full of people, and you think that everyone was receiving what I'm saying, but there's people in here that don't want to hear what I'm saying right now. But it's not going to stop me. Do you know why? Because I'm, I'm in the family business. I'm in the family business. Not everybody goes to QP. Some people go to McDonald's, but QP don't close the doors because people go to McDonald's. So I'm going to tell you about Jesus, all right? You might not receive him, but that's not going to stop me from talking about him. Do you understand that? All right, just a commercial for God. Here we go. Verse 26. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest in it. So the one that he gave five to and the one that he gave two to doubled on the investment. So listen, how, God, how good has God been to you? Very good. He's made investments in you all the time. Some of you shouldn't even be alive right now, but he made an investment in you. Some of your homes should have been lost in foreclosure, but he made an investment in you. Some of you thought you'd be single your whole life, but he made an investment in you. All right? So now it's our job to go out into this world of broken and hurt and lost people and begin to tell them about the goodness of God so that he might get another investment on his return. When you tell people of the goodness of God and the experiences and the testimonies that you have, that produces produces another customer for heaven to say, hey, sign me up for this God. I need a healing or I need, I need to be increased in some kind of way or I've got problems that need solved. So now the investment that God made in me of delivering me from kidney failure and delivering me from car accidents and all these kinds of things, I'm able to tell somebody else and then God delivers them and then they're able to tell somebody else and you know what? I get credit for that initial investment. I'm trying to tell you, and I'm trying to wake up the church to let you know that 
Coming to church is not the work you're called to do on earth. It's part of it, but it's not the only thing. The work you're called to do on earth is to, to recognize that outside of this church, people are dying and they are lost and they are killing each other and they are depressed and suicides at an all-time high. And you've got a product that works every single time. There is nothing that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot overcome. And you, listen, there was a, there was a commercial back in the day that said, I'm not only a, a, a representative or something, but I'm a client as well. How much that they believe in the product. See, when you get to the point where you refuse to be silent anymore, that's what will change the city. When you start talking about God outside of these walls, it's going to create a buzz in this city, and there's going to be a new sound in Lima. What's the sound? The sound is that the church finally got off of their behinds and went out into the streets and began to do the work and pro proclaim the goodness of God to a lost and dying generation. Listen, it's not, my dad used to say this all the time, it's not in a sinner's nature to come to church. They don't want to come to church. We've got to go get them. The great, the great commission is not for the church to come, for the sinner to come to church, but for us to go to them. I'm so sick and tired of people talking bad about Lima, and the, we've, it, it's the church's fault, though. It's the church's fault. It's not the cops' fault. It's not the parents' fault. It's the church's fault because the cops don't have the answer and the parents don't have the answer, but the church has the answer. When will we get fed up to the point where we say, you know what? I'm not going to bury my talent anymore. I'm not going to bury my ability anymore. I'm not going to bury this bad news anymore. I'm going to tell people about the goodness of God. But the first thing that must happen for, for that to be the truth in the church is this. Some of us really need to experience being born again because not all of us have truly been born again. You know what? Our doors are open out there, and I don't believe, and I know for a fact, that none of the greeters said, as you walked in, are you born again? Okay, come on in. Are you born again? Okay, come on in. Everybody's welcome here. Because you know what? Coming to church doesn't save you. Coming to church doesn't make you righteous. Coming to church doesn't make you born again. Coming to church doesn't make you a good person. Coming to church doesn't produce any of those things for you. Coming to Christ does. And truly being born again is what needs to happen inside of all of us. So I want to take a moment to pray for us all right now. Father, if anybody in this place is just going through the motions and not really born again, I pray that you would wake them up before it's too late, God. May we not fool, we can fool each other, but we can't fool you. So I pray, Father God, that everyone would truly come to know you as the Lord and Savior of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I have gotten some interest from it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is not what we want. So the biggest investment of all time is the investment that God made inside of every one of us of Jesus Christ. And he's expecting a return on that investment, all right? And here's what the family business is, all right? We have God-given assignments to shine the light of God. Let's say this together. I have a God-given assignment to shine the light of God 
that is within me on others so that our Father in heaven will be glorified. So that's what an assignment is. It's these divine assignments that God has given each of our lives, just like he gave one five bags, one two bags, and one one, and he expected a return on his investment. God has given you all abilities and giftings so that you can fulfill the assignment or the mandate on your life, but you must present yourself back to him as a living sacrifice and say, God, here I am, use my life for your glory. And that's the only way. Heaven is not an easy, thing, easy place to get to. And the Bible tells us that, that broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, but the way of life is very narrow. And he said this, listen, very few people will ever find it. Few. So listen, don't do what everybody else is doing. You need to be doing what the few is doing. You need to be faithful to God. You need to be consecrated to God, which means holy and separated for God for his own personal use. This life that we're living is not for us. It's not for our enjoyment. It's not for self at all. And here's what the Bible says. If any of us seek to save our life, we'll lose it. But if we're willing to lose it for his sake, we'll find it. Amen? Matthew 5, 16 outlines our assignment, and it says, Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the family business is this, making sure that God gets glory in heaven from earth. That's the family business we've all been called to. So listen, I want you to understand that sometimes the product that you're given to use for God to get glory in your life is going to come in its rawest form. It's going to come as trouble. It's going to come as struggle. It's going to come as affliction. But that very product, once it reaches your hands and once you apply your faith to it, will turn around if you are diligent to trust God and become glory for God. Every single problem I have ever faced, every issue I've ever faced that I've given to God is now being used for his glory. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he delivers them from them all. Why? It's for his glory. Say this with me. I was created for his glory. If I could just convince you to work in the family business of producing glory for God, you will see all of your troubles melt away. You won't be worried about a thing because the family business is making sure that God receives glory from every avenue of our life. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm a good enough father or good enough husband. You know what? That's okay. What I do is I give that surrendered father and surrendered husband to God and say, God, get glory from this man. Get glory from my weakness. And oh, praise God, that's exactly what he promises to do. That if we would allow him to enter into our weakness, his strength will be made perfect and, and glory goes to the Father. I want to show you this cycle. We're in the family business of giving God glory. So when trouble comes upon us and these, these things come in our lives and they, they try to beat us down and they try to make us weak, God says, Jesus says this, that in our weakness, his strength, whose strength? His strength is made perfect. So in that moment, when his strength comes to our weakness and is made perfect, God receives glory from that moment. So if any of you have problems or issues or concerns, can you raise your hand? If you've got any problems, issues, or concern, I want you to see that as an opportunity for Jesus Christ to get glory from your lives because we are in the family business of producing glory for God. See, our story for his glory our struggle for his glory so that we might have a collection of testimonies. And the only way that you will ever have a testimony is to be tested. And on the other side of that test is the testimony which gives glory to God. So listen, 
cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. As long as you carry it around, it's trouble. But as soon as you release it and cast your cares upon him, it becomes glory for God. Let this be your anti anxiety medication. Let this be your sleeping pill. That all those things that keep you awake at night and all those troubles that you have, you are in the family business of producing glory for God. So listen, I just want you to see life as an assembly line. And on this end, God puts trouble on this end of the assembly line. It's the first part that goes down the line. And it begins to move down the line, all right, and it comes to you. And when it reaches you, you've got a decision to make at your place in the assembly line. You can either pick it up and say, oh, boy, this is ugly. How am I going to pay this bill? She doesn't love me anymore. What am I going to do? When's this pain going to leave? Oh, my goodness. And just sit down and just stare at the problem and just cry and just worry, not knowing that this wasn't the end of the assembly line. We were created for his glory, and these troubles and struggles that God sends our way, he wants them back. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's got to be the last one that touches it, not you. Stop handling your problems. Stop touching them because they're bringing you depression. They're bringing you down. But you've got to, when it comes your way, down the assembly line from heaven, all right? As it comes down, because he says many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So they're coming, honey. So it's not all daisies and kumbaya. You're going to have some trouble and you're going to have some struggles. But they produce glory for God if you will have faith. So you pick up the trouble, and you look at it, and it comes to your door, and you say, by faith, Father, this thing is too big for me. I can't fix this thing. I can't turn it around. But your word says that in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. So God, see, God gives us the strength to do one thing. Listen. You can't fix it. You can't turn it around for yourself. You can't carry it, especially. The only strength, the only, the only strength or energy you have as it relates to any trouble or circumstance that comes into your life is to pick it up and throw it at the feet of Jesus. Cast your cares upon me. And as you begin to do that, as you begin to do that, once he gets it, once Jesus gets it, once it's been entrusted into him, he'll say, Father, here is something for your glory. Your son or your daughter has trusted me. They have put their confidence and faith in me. They have prayed, oh, this is good. They have prayed in my name, and you said whatever they pray in my name, you will do for them. I want you to know something that you might not know, but you should know. Did you know that Jesus prays for you by name? Do you know that he intercedes for you? Jesus does. So it's time for us to come into agreement with everything that he's praying for us. Amen? Amen. Can you come here for a minute? God just wants me to pray for you immediately. I forgot to do that. Father, tell me your name again. Jazzy. Father, I pray for Jazzy right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray right now that you would chase away every cloud that comes to Father to make her think that she's less than anybody else. I rebuke every word that's ever been spoken over her by any kind of bully or any kind of negative voices, God. I just cancel it right now in Jesus' name. Father, melt away every part of her identity, God, that was not meant for her. I thank you that she is beautiful and she is smart and she is talented, God, and she is victorious. And Father, I, come, I pray right now that she would come to have a personal relationship with you. Jazzy, Jesus loves you so much. 
And if God is for you, even if everyone in the whole world is against you, it doesn't matter because God is for you. And he's always going to protect you and always going to bless you. Father, I pray against every knucklehead boy that would attempt to get close to her and, Father, use her uh, for a, a use, Father God, that is not godly. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that every boy that's trying to text her or message her in any way, God, I pray that you would just cause those things to stop. Protect her right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father God, that she has been reserved for a man of God, that one day you're going to send a man of God in her life, and her husband's going to be a godly man, a strong man, and he's going to do all those things that you've called him to do for her. So I thank you, God that Jazzy is waiting for that one that you have sent for her. But in the meantime, God, continue to encourage her in every way. I thank you that she excels in all of her schoolwork, God. I thank you that her value comes from you and nothing else. I pray blessings over Jazzy this day. May she live and not die. And may the glory of the Lord shine upon her every single place she goes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, Jazzy. Now, brothers and sisters, what you just saw happen right there is called an assignment. Can you say assignment? They are direct orders that God will give you to do something, and you don't have a choice in the matter. You have to obey. As soon as he says do it, do it. Now, if I, was, if I was a man of, um, just say, well, we've got to have order. Uh, well, Lord, it can wait till I'm done preaching. I don't get to tell God when to do something that he told me to do, and neither do you. We have to obey immediately what these assignment is. That's what an assignment is. God says, I want you to do this because we are his kids, okay? If we obey his voice, and we do exactly that, and now we will see, there will be a testimony. I, I better get an invitation to the wedding. I know that's years from now. It's a long time, but I want, an, I want an invitation, and I'll be able to stand up and say, there's the one we prayed for, that Father's Day 2019. There's the man that we prayed for, and, and what's the, what, 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 what happens? Glory for God. It's all about glory for God. Say this with me. My life is all about glory for God. Father, I pray for your servants in this hour. I pray for them all right now, God, that they would come to know their assignment in you. And Lord, you're not calling them to do anything in and of themselves because you want uh, the flesh, the carnal side of us to be removed. All you're asking for, and all you're looking for is a humble servant. Church, can you say this with me? Lord, make me a humble servant. So, Father, we thank you that you're doing just that. You're making us to be humble servants, God, because this city needs help, and the cities that are represented in this room need help. And, Father, we trust that the hope of this world lives on the inside of us, and his name is Jesus Christ. And as soon as we begin to share Jesus, light will shine into the darkness of our city and the places that we live, and things will change for your glory. Lima is not too big of an assignment for your glory. So, Father, you gave Brooke a word months ago about cultivate the people for rain. And the rain we've been receiving here recently is historic. The farmers not able to do the things that they want to do. It's, it's a historic rainfall that's happening right now. So, Father, I pray that this historic rainfall, can you stand to your feet quickly? Stand to your feet. Can I, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Father, I pray that this historic rainfall would be you pouring out your spirit on the sons and daughters, God. Pour out your spirit on sons and daughters so that we would come to know who we are in you and so that we would quickly begin to do the work. The analogy you gave me, God, is 
if we had a week to go get as many family members and loved ones as we could and convince them to come to the ark, how busy would we be? We'd be on the phone, we'd be emailing, we'd be going, because we would know that time is running out. But then you said, we don't have a week, all we have is a day. All we have is the time that you've given us today. So, Father, we repent for being like the one that received one coin, one piece of silver, and buried it. How long has our, have our ministries been buried? How long have we been silent about the Holy One, the Messiah? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray for a release and opening of our mouths, God. May the river of living water that ab abides inside of your believers begin to be expelled from our mouths into the streets of Lima and every other place that we live. May the living water overtake the deadness of our city, God, in the name of Jesus. May we be more bold and may we be more vocal to tell people about the goodness of Jesus Christ. For you have not given us a spirit of fear. Say this with me. I am not afraid. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to say it again. Father, as we say it again, I pray that faith would come into this place, God, in the name of Jesus. For your word says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here are laborers gathered in this place, but some of them are afraid to speak out uh, of your goodness because of what men will think of them or what men will say. But Father, as we say it one more time, I pray in Jesus' name that something would break on the inside of us and that power and love of the sound mind would come exploding into our spirit and cast away every single ounce of fear that we have of being a Jesus follower and one that pronounces your name name in these streets. Let it begin here, just as it was on the day that your Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, and your word says that you gave them power to become witnesses. We pray right now in Jesus' name that on this day, that as we declare that we are not afraid to be bold for Jesus Christ, that we will begin to open up our mouths, and we won't be silent anymore, and we won't bury our ministry. We won't bury the good news, because if we hide the good news, we're only hiding it from those who perish. So, Father, as we declare this one more time, we pray that something would happen in our spirit, that we would receive the boldness that comes from a lion, the lion of Judah. We are members of the tribe of the Lion of Judah, and we just declare right now in Jesus' name that the lion roar will come from our belly, and we will begin to pray and decree a thing and see it happen. We are not a timid people. We are not an afraid people. We are not church mice that just come and gather and quiet and then leave and still quiet. The time for being quiet is over. It is time to blow your trumpets right now. It is time to make the sound known in the city that there is a deliverer and that there is a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. May everyone be, or everyone put the trumpet to their mouth and blow and may the sound of deliverance be heard throughout this city as your church completes its mandate to go into the hedges and the highways and compel men to come to you. So we're going to say it again. We're going to say, I am not afraid. Go. We are not afraid. They're going to talk about us, but we're not afraid. They're going to tell us to be quiet, but we are not afraid. All hell is going to come against us, but we are not afraid. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that power, love, and a sound mind is our portion. So we go out into the streets with power, and we go out into the streets with love, and we go out into these streets with a sound mind. In the name of Jesus, every single one of you has a gift on this Father's Day. You've got the gift of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever will believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Father, I pray that everyone has received that life, and those that have received it now have a responsibility to tell others about it. And Father, we're going to bring this thing to completion by saying it a third time for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may this thing be complete, and may fear of witnessing totally be broken, and may we swing open wide the door for the Holy Spirit to be our mouth, and we will not be afraid. Say it one more time. I will. Not, I am not afraid. So, Father, I thank you that that settles it. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. We are not afraid. We are in the family business of being ministers of reconciliation. We've got the answer for Lima, Dayton, Walpole, Crydersville, Bluffton, Wherever we're from, we've got the answer. So, Lord, I thank you that we take the answer, who is Jesus Christ, out to these streets, and we will not bury it. We will tell of your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's one, if there's one of you here today that desire to give your life to Jesus Christ, to get on the ark while the door is still open, if, if, you, if you don't know for certainty that if you die within the next 10 or 15 minutes where you would go, then you need to be raising your hand during these times where the door is open for salvation. And that's not to scare you, but it's true. We don't want to be lost when there is a Savior right in front of us named Jesus. So if you desire to be born again and have all your sins forgiven and be included in the Lamb's Book of Life, I just ask that you raise your hand high wherever you are, and we'll pray for you this morning and trust that God is going to save your soul. I see Dave. So, Father, I thank you for Dave recommitting his life to you, God. Thank you for everything that you're doing in his life. Continue to bless him in every single way. I thank you, Father God, for filling him with your Holy Spirit so that he might have the power over every temptation that comes his way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite...